Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Sebastian Burkhardt to you. He is visiting us from the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been working uh, towards his PhD with uh, Professor Lure and Professor Martin. Uh, his thesis uh, work is on uh, automatic verification of uh, tricky uh, concurrent data structures. Um, and while prior work uh, has worked on this problem occasionally on uh, verifying it for sequentially consistent memory model, uh, Milo is perhaps the first one to really push in the direction of verifying these kind of data structures for weaker memory models. Uh, and that's what he's going to tell us about today. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything more for this first slide so we can start. So the general motivation, just to back up a step. Um, the general motivation is that shared memory multiprocessors are taking over the world in the sense that architecture is pushing those things with the multi-core processors. And our ability to write the software for those things is kind of lagging behind. So what happens is if you have concurrent executions of multi-threaded software on shared memory multiprocessor, uh, we end up with lots of bugs. And the, the reason is that verification is really quite hard. This is true in general, not just for my specific area here. So the problem is that tests are not good at finding all interleavings. These executions are very non-deterministic. And reasoning is a lot more challenging for concurrent programs than for sequential programs. And it wasn't easy for sequential programs to start with. Now, the standard strategy um, is, of course, this, this is what we are taught in, in classes about concurrent programming, is to use locks to restrict the concurrent accesses. Specifically, we don't want writes to erase with reads or writes to erase with writes. Um, that's when you have to use locks. And that makes it easier to verify. So there are fewer interleavings. There's a clearer reasoning based on mutual exclusion. And we can use tools to find the races. But locks also have their drawbacks. So there are some problems with locks, like introduce deadlocks. So one good question is, what do you do after your tool finds a race? Um, what's the solution? And you know, if you just insert locks, then you may un end up with a deadlock. So uh, it's not in general easy to find a good locking strategy for a program. Um, so locks can hurt performance, because you basically restrict the concurrency. So if you have a single lock protecting your entire program, then you get no concurrency at all. Only one processor can execute at a time. And locks are also not robust. So the problem is if a thread fails while it holds a lock, then no, nobody else can keep working. And there's also dangerous in, if you have interrupts. So this is more in the operating system level. Um, if you interrupt a thread holding a lock, you get into trouble. So what are the alternatives? Now, one big alternative would be transactional memory, but I'm not talking about that. So let's look at other things. So here is uh, basically what I see as a promise and the problem with that promise. So concurrency libraries, I think, are a good way to simplify the programming of multiple processors. So there are two things that are good about such libraries. They simplify the development in the sense that the programmer can use building blocks that are already verified. Uh, they can also Building blocks can already be optimized. So in particular, there have been these implementations of lock-free data types. And clearly, if, if it, there is nothing wrong in the idea, with the idea of having things like queues or sets that don't use locks at all, um, it would be perfect for a programmer if you could just use those structures. The problem is they're really hard to actually write. So how does that work? Um, the problem really is that the optimizations, like this lock-freeness, uh, introduce a lot of complexity. And there is one more thing that makes it difficult to, to build those things, which is that the multiprocessors use relaxed memory models. And uh, I'm going to talk more about that in the following. So what I'm attempting to do here is really trying to bring a couple different areas together to make it work. So we have, on the architecture side, we have the multiprocessors and we have the relaxed memory models. On the distributed algorithms side, we have people coming up with tricky algorithms that are, you know, promise much better performance that don't use locks, which all sounds very great. And uh, the third aisle here is we have computer-aided verification, which we know has made a lot of progress and is able to model check Z code 
and can give sound counterexamples as an important tool of, of getting things right. So what we're trying to do here is bringing all those things together. So we bring this together in form of a tool called JackFence. And uh, the methodology of this tool we discuss in two publications in CAV and PLDI. So let me go into an example. So here we have a client program which executes on multiple processors. So that's the premise of this talk today. We really talk multiple processors, not just multiple threads. Um, and this, this client program makes calls to a data type, which is a queue in this case. Say this calls NQ, NQ, DQ, DQ. You, I'm sure you recognize this as you know, consumer producer pattern, very frequently done like that. And here we have the implementation, which provides the code for each operation. And the trick here, there are no locks. Now, how, how can we do that? How can we do this right without locks? Actually, it's very difficult. So there is a publication of this. Uh, this is not the only algorithm, but it's a good one to, to take. I only show you one of the two operations, namely the DQ operation. And uh, you, can, you can see there's a lot going on here. So the basic idea is simple. It's a linked list with head and tail pointers. But getting this to work is actually very tricky. So there's a lot. I, I don't expect you to read through this and understand it. I don't think it's possible to do that. Um, but I can give you some highlights. So there are compare and swap operations used instead of locks. And there are some relaxations going on, like um, the tail pointer is allowed to lag behind the actual tail. You can't always guarantee that it's pointing at the actual tail. And uh, the program does tricks, like here it reads the head of the queue, and here it reads it again and compares it to the previously read value. Uh, so those are like the kind of tricks that, that these uh, people use. And the whole thing is wrapped in a loop, which is a retry loop. So you try to do this, and if you sometimes you detect that something is wrong, then you start over. Um, well, you have to read the paper to, to find out exactly how this works, but it's very tricky. Now, what is the expectation of the programmer on this? Uh, the expectation basically is you want this to work as if it was sequentially consistent. So what that means is the programmer observes this. The client program sees the operations. It sees the values that are passed in and the values that come out. And what you want is this observation has to be consistent with some interleaving of the operations. So you require that for all observations, there should be some witness interleaving that produces those results that you're actually seeing. So that's all that the programmer, at this point, that's all that the programmer wants. Uh, maybe there will be more at some point. Um, now, what's the problem here? So the client program wants sequential consistency. The problem is the underlying hardware is, is not so generous. So there's no guarantee that the hardware actually, on its level, gives sequential consistency. So it's the job of the implementation to hide the relaxations in the hardware from the programmer. Now, what are the hardware relaxations? So this is an example of what goes wrong on a multiprocessor when you work with loads and stores. So um, I have an execution here. Processor 1 writes value 1 to x, writes value 2 to y. Processor 2 reads here. Something is wrong about this execution. Uh, I, I, I can try to point it out what it is. Uh, it is there is no witness interleaving. Why not? So I, I'll show you green arrows that mean this should happen before this in any interleaving. So clearly, by the definition of interleaving, you want things to appear in program order. So this should happen before this, and this should happen before that. Now, there's more arrows, because here we read the value y and get 2. So clearly, this read has to happen after this store. But there's one more. Here we read 0. So this read has to happen before this store. Otherwise, it would read 1. And you see we have, we have a cycle. So this is not a sequentially consistent execution. Now, this is the reality on, on multiprocessors. Um, for software to work right under such circumstances, you need additional instructions called memory fences, which allow you basically to uh, restrict the hardware in its reordering of instructions. So let me do a, a little bit of uh, background on relaxed memory models. Um, what platforms use relaxed memory models? The answer is most. So it includes in, in Intel, both uh, regular x86 and Titanium, PowerPC, Spark, Alpha, C6, that's, that's the main frames. Uh, a good question would be, why doesn't everything break? Like, if you start reordering loads and stores, why doesn't everything break? That's a very good question. And the answer is, I mean, first of all, single-threaded programs are not affected. All these relaxations are designed to be invisible to single-threaded programs. But also, this is very important here, 
race-free programs are not affected. So if you do what you're told in class and use locks to protect every access, you're actually safe. You won't, you won't ever see these relaxations. There's actually a very good reason to follow you know, the lock-based lock programming model. Now, the problem is for the implementations that we look at, there are races. They use races on purpose for better performance. So um, unfortunately, they are exposed to relaxed memory models. Now, what's the challenge for the verification here? So the challenge is that the number of executions grows and grows if you have finer grain concurrency. So if you start with serial executions, this is basically the model where each operation is protected by one lock you do the whole thing, you interleave on the operation boundary, then you don't have so many executions. Now, if you go away from locks, then you interleave the instructions of the different threads on an instruction order. Um, you get a lot more executions. But with relaxed memory models, it gets even worse. Because now, not only do you interleave the different threads, but you also start splitting instructions and, in, and reordering instructions within a thread. Um, so this ma makes the verification a lot harder. How do we verify something like that? Um, so there are a couple of problems with existing tools. So we don't really have a model checker that can handle relaxed models. We would be forced to make each instruction into a separate process. Uh, the correctness condition also is not supported in this form. So there is no tool right now that checks sequential consistency of uh, data type. And uh, we have the problem that we actually should support the features that appear in those implementations. So we need to handle dynamic memory, pointers, arrays, structs, and so on. Which is done, I mean, a lot of tools exist that do have this ability to handle details of this kind. Unfortunately, those tools are written for sequential programs. So um, that was the first part. Now I'll get to my solution, or our solution, I should say. Uh, of course, there's a lot of work. Yes? Can you just say some more about, you said before that if you, as long as you use locks, you're OK. Yeah. But, um, does that mean that the thread locks anything at all? Or what are the conditions? Um, are there re restrictions on how you use the locks? Or does it mean that as so, long as you yeah. get any lock operation, everything is OK? Well, there, there is a definition of what is a race. So me, using locks correctly means there are no data races, meaning that um, whenever you have uh, uh, two accesses, one of, at least one of which is a write to the same memory location, they must be ordered by synchronization instructions, meaning a lock or a non-lock operation. Now, um, yeah, that's so, yeah, so there is the question how, how so the, the reason why it works is that you have in the lock and in the unlock operations there are memory fences, which will guarantee enough memory ordering um, for you to be safe. Um, but there, there are some complications if, you're lock, if you have not, have not only lock and unlock, but our something like, you know, tentatively a query lock, that may lead to problems if you use something like that. But I think the hardware doesn't know, when you acquire a lock, the hardware doesn't know which memory locations that lock is supposed to protect. Uh, yeah, so, so the guarantee really doesn't work by the hardware knowing about the locks. The guarantee works because inside the lock operation there is a fence, and inside the unlock operation there is another fence. So those fences are enough to, to guarantee the necessary ordering of instructions then it seems like just locking anything at all would. Yes, correct. I, oh, OK, yes. OK, so this is the, the, the way I've structured our tool. Um, so we have here the C code for the data operations. Uh, we, and now this thing needs a little explanation because we work with tests. So what is a symbolic test in this case? Well, for a queue, it, can, it's, it would look something like this. This is a simple one. I have two threads. One does an NQ and one does a DQ. And you see I have symbolic values for the arguments that are passed in and for the values returned. So those are the inputs to the tool. I also select the memory tool, memory model, that I want to verify this for. And the answer of the tool can either be pass or fail. Pass would be accompanied by a witness, which is just one example execution of the, program, of the test. Or it can be a fail plus counterexample. And the, tail, the fail would basically show you an execution where the observed results, meaning the valuations to these values x and y, are not consistent with, with any sequential execution of these operations. Uh, Sebastian, yes. what is the witness in the pass case? So um, the witness that um, sometimes, so the reason why I do a witness is if you, if you start putting things in like assumes, 
in your test cases, which is an option you have, then you made up with vacuous execution, meaning that there's no execution at all. And you want to catch that, because that's, not some, that's actually a, a mistake in your test framework that you want to find out about. So that's why I basically do not only solve for failing executions, but I also solve for at least one passing execution to make sure that so if this are works. Assumed in the code, then you don't need to do all this. Uh, no, this is purely a service if you want to look at one passing execution. Yeah. So, so what does pass mean? Does pass mean that every interleaving of the test has a corresponding sequentially consistent execution? Yes. So internally, what I do is the following. Um, so I take the C code and run it to the SIL front end. So my ability to handle C actually relies on a lot of work that other people have done for me, which gives me a cleaned up uh, input for my tool. The symbolic test goes in here as well. In here, I take those two things and create a SAT encoding. And with the SAT solver, I look for an execution which violates the conditions. And uh, if I find it, I format a trace that we can look at. And there's some magic going on here with loop bounds and specification that I'll talk about later. So uh, I want to start with the demo. So this is a remote session on, on some computer. And I, I want to show you basically what goes into the test and what comes out of the tool. So we have a couple files here. Let's start with the actual code. So you can see this is just standard C code. Here we have some data structures defined, the queue data type, and a node, which are individual nodes of the queue. This is a two-lock queue. So it's not lock-free, but it does have races. It has a, a lock for the head and for the tail. And uh, down here, we have the operations. We don't need to look at this in detail. I, I just want to give you a, a, an impression. So here is the NQ operation. Down here, the DQ operation. Now, we want to test this. So these are the tests that we want to run. So this notation is um, brief. So test T0 here uh, first initializes the queue, and then this means concurrently executing threads. So I have two threads here, one doing one NQ and one doing one DQ operation. Uh, test 4, TPC4 down here. TPC is for uh, test producer consumer has one thread doing four NQs in a sequence and then four DQs, the other thread doing four DQs in a se sequence. So I, I tried to make this, yes? Sure. Like why, why does I means uh, initialize or E? OK, I'll action? show you. It's the next, next thing. Yeah, so there's something missing here. That would be magic, wouldn't it? Uh, so there's something called harness. So this is the connection between the tests and the actual program. So what I do here is, I mean, those are the letters that we had before. Um, but here, you know, for the NQ, I actually create a non-deterministic value. So in this case, I choose a range between 0 and 1, um, which will be symbolic in the encoding. Um, and I also annotate these observe uh, things. So I have to make somehow clear what is, what is the observe, what is the API of the data type. So we see it's not as automatic as you may think knowing what is actually being passed into a procedure and what's coming out, you, you need to specify that in some way. And in this way, I chose an easy way. Basically, I, I encode it with code. You could encode this using some specification language. Uh, maybe an interesting part here is that um, this observation of the output value is conditional on the fact that the queue is empty or not. So you know, if the queue is empty, you don't want to look at the value that is returned. So that's why this observation here is conditional. Um, no assertion. So the assertion is, is the top idea that everything should be sequentially consistent. I see. So that, there are, that you're checking that there are enough fences in there so that it appears to be sequentially yes. consistent. Yes. Okay. You can add assertions, too. I mean, in every practical verification project, you will want to add as many assertions as possible. So, so, so uh, for that question, if you want to check that uh, what you get out is what you get put in, you will have to add a state machine to no, you don't add a state machine. So there's, this is the, the specification mining. The specification is generated automatically from what you have already seen. So the reason is that but if you want to specify that 
output equals input? Well, the, the reason, the, well, I, let me say it this way. So there are two things you can do. One is, and this is what we do in this demo, there is no specification of how the queue is supposed to work except for the implementation that we already have. And the idea is that if you take this implementation and you assume that all serialized executions are correct, meaning that the code, you assume the code is already correct if each operation is executed atomically, which is usually true, then you can take that as your specification for the rest of the executions. And this is what we do in this demo. Um, in practice, you may want to do something else, which is write a little reference queue, you know, five-minute project. Use that as your specification for your concurrent queue. And where would you put that? Uh, you would write the, basically the same things you have seen here. Then you do a preliminary first run, which extracts the specification out of your reference implementation, and then uses that specification for the test. OK, so now I just say compile. And the result is an intermediate representation, which I won't explain, but I'll show you briefly so you know what's, what's going to happen. And now it's time to actually run the tool. So I say check fence. I say which test I want. In this case, it was T0. I have to say which memory model. So I start with sequential consistency. And of course, I have to input the code that I just compiled. And uh, there it goes. So you can see there are two steps. Uh, one was the specification mining. I'll talk more about that later, but I already gave you a brief overview. Second step is result passed. So it works for sequential consistency. Um, now, what's what does that mean? That you are All executions are observably ex equivalent to some sequentially consistent execution. Well, you could give another memory model there also. Uh, so now I try a different memory model. And it fails. So, you know, what I said earlier is this thing has a race condition. I run it on a relaxed memory model. I actually expect something to go wrong. And it did. So now we have to find out what is it that went wrong. Okay. So in order to look at this, I actually copy this to a public directory and look at it with a browser. So here we are. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So this is uh, the output that I generate in HTML form. And it takes a little bit getting used to, to browse through these things, but I'll, I'll give you the overview. So we have two threads, T1 and T2. T1 does the NQ, T2 does the DQ. We see the values that were used. So 0 was NQ. Then the result of the DQ was 1 here, meaning that it was not empty. But the value returned was undefined. So undefined is a value that I load into memory locations that are not loaded in the beginning of the test case. So um, what, ha what went wrong? So now I look at the thread T2, and it gives me a trace of the execution of this thread. So this is not the actual source code. Uh, if you step through the source code with a debugger, you're used to seeing a narrow advancing. That doesn't work very well for multi-threaded programs on a, mul on a weak memory model, because the arrow would be all over the place. It wouldn't execute the instructions in sequence. So what I show instead is I show a trace of what was executed, of all the instructions. These line numbers tie back to the C code. And uh, you see a couple things here. I show, in, in purple, I show the value that was assigned, in case if it's an assignment, or loaded on stored. I show in blue. Um, the, the load or store instructions that were part of these instructions. So um, sometimes there is more than one load and store per line. For example, here, I load some value, and then it's stored here. So that's why I have both a load and a store in this instruction. Um, the numbers next to the load or store are the total sequence number of that access. So you know, here, for example, 34 means this load was you know, number 34 in the total sequence of, of loads and stores. So now we have a way of finding out what went wrong, looking at thread 2. So this undefined value came from here. It was loaded by this load, load number 40. So I can click on that. So um, this gives me a slice of all accesses to that one memory location. So I see there were only two accesses to that memory location. And obviously, this store is probably what should have been loaded by this load. But it happened too late. So why does this store happen too late? 
I'll click on it, get a view. So this is the store, store number 48. This is the store that stores the value that is being enqueued into the node. And it happened too late. Now this is, happens, if you have worked with relaxed memory models before, it's a standard fail. If you write into a node and then you link the node into the list, you have to make sure that this store happens before the node is linked into the list. So what you need is, you need actually a fence between those stores. So let me put that in. What I don't understand is what does the tool deem as a failure? Uh, so it looks at all executions. It looks at all observations that you get from those executions. Uh -huh. So you can think of all the symbolic values that they had, the arguments, the return values. You, think, you can think of this as a vector of values. Now for each vector of values you can decide is this a valid observation or not. Valid in the sense that it corresponds to some serial execution or invalid if, the, if it does not correspond to serial execution. So what that means is that the, the first time you ran the tool with sequential consistency, that was basically a vacuous check because you're saying that assume sequential consistency and check for sequential consistency. Am I right? Uh, not quite, but the idea is right. So the idea is that I run two times, um, but I don't compare sequential consistency and relaxed. I compare serial and relaxed. So serial means uh, fully atomic. So the entire operation is atomic, which is stronger than just sequential consistency. So in the first case, you were comparing sequential consistency and serial. In the second case, you were considering relaxed against serial. Yes. Okay. Conceptually, you can compare anything with anything. Because all you do is you store the observations in a set, which are explicitly enumerate. And then you run again, and you can compare these sets. OK, um, so now I have to introduce a fence here. And I think because we're running out of time, I'll just you know, tell you where the other fence goes. Yeah. What is, what is the lock doing there? That was lock free. Uh, so yeah, this is not the lock-free queue that we had earlier. This is a queue with two locks, but it's not race-free. So it has some optimizations, but no, it still has locks. It's common that, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. OK, so because I don't want to uh, take too long on this example, I, I just put in another fence that, you know, you would find in another country example. I'll just put it in. MS2. Try this again. So this time it passed. And of course we have, we can try the longer tests. So there was the test T1, which is just a bit, little bit longer. And I'll also try a test that the, the, the one that has four NQs and four DQs, which really puts a little bit more stress on the tool. So this time it actually takes a little longer to run up through all this. Right. Yeah. So isn't test four different from the first two tests in that it uh, sequentializes? Uh, the it's different so it because has two threads instead of like eight. Yes. Yeah, so it has it has more than one operation per thread. That's the difference. Right. So if you had eight threads instead of two threads. Yes. So you get very similar performance. So what, what happens in if in this encoding that I use? Um, the performance of the tool is, is very similar if you have eight operations in eight threads or eight operations divided in two threads. So interleaving doesn't matter. Is that For this encoding, not so much. Because I, I, I have to tackle the fact that the memory model does wild interleavings. So because I do that already, how many threads you choose is not such a big deal. It matters more how much instructions are in your test. So um, yeah, so it's still solving. Thank you for the question during the run. That was, was great as a <laughs> distraction. <laughs> so the, uh, I don't understand also exactly what's the difference between the two tests. So you are checking, right? So yes. um, often in, uh, in, in log-free code or when it's parallelized, mm -hmm. uh, the results 
are okay if they differ a bit. You just want to avoid race conditions or, or undefinedness. So are you so the race conditions here, there are intentional races here. So you can't check for avoiding race conditions in this code. Um, what you want to guarantee is that your data type looks like it's, it's everything is atomic. You know, you want your operations to appear like they're atomic and they're not interleaved at all. So you're really, so you're really checking if there is a sequential execution possible with the yes. result set you're get, getting. Exactly. Not exactly. always for the same. Uh, no, not for the same. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, so this it passed, which is good. Which means I can stop this demo now. Go back to the presentation. Okay, so uh, now we wanna, I want to show you a little more about how it works internally. So the core of this whole tool is this part, where we encode the executions on a relaxed memory model as a CNF formula, conjunctive normal form. So the, the, the key idea here is to, to compile the code into instruction sequences of finite length for each thread. And then I represent the relative border of the memory axis is using SAT variables. Um, yeah, and basically the memory model is represented by an axiomatic specification which I compile directly into the SAT formula. I, I'll get into more detail later. This is the interesting part, really. Um, but I'll stay a little bit on the surface for now. So from C to CNF, it's, it's quite a long way to get from the C code to the actual formula. So the steps here are, I start with the front end, which does a lot of work for me, um, which I'm very glad I don't have to do all that work. Um, then there are some interesting steps here where I go into the intermediate language. So one thing I do is I maintain the tree structure of the abstract syntax tree instead of going to a control flow graph. The reason is that when I'm unrolling the loops, I have much better control over, over the unrolling if my program has tree structure than if it has control flow graph structure. Uh, I represent pointers as lists of offsets rather than calculating the actual number that corresponds to the pointer. And I use runtime types, not static types. So in C, the static types are quite worthless because even if you know what the type is in C, it really only tells you the bit width of your thing. Uh, everything else is a matter of how the programmer uses it. So why do you need types at all? Um, I type? want more checking than without types. So I do want to check if you dereference a null pointer. I want to find out about that. I do want to find out if you do illegal things with things. So I can find a lot uh, failures a lot better if I do not. I do not only do, you know, checking if everything is equivalent to serial executions. I also check for a lot of other cleanness <coughs> properties. That's why I have these runtime types. And um, then I perform a range analysis. Basically, before I encode into SAT eagerly, I want to know what are the possible values of each assignment and memory location. And uh, as I said earlier, we have all these interleavings and reorderings. And thank God I can use a flow insensitive static analysis. And I'm, I don't care about interleavings at all. So, so that works nicely. And because everything is finite, uh, I can even make that terminate. So all of these things are uh, sort of interesting, but I don't want to make them the center of this talk, so I'm going to go on to other things. Um, so how do I get from C to CNF? So once I have my instruction streams for the individual threads, I do two things separately. I encode the thread local semantics, and I encode this communication between threads. Those are two different pieces of my SAT encoding. So for the thread local semantics, as I said, we unroll the loops and we get a finite instruction sequence for each thread. After doing that, we use SAT variables to represent all the values that appear in that instruction stream and the outcome of conditionals. And we can create clauses that express the computation that's going on and how values flow within threads. Question. Yes? When you say you unroll the loops, how many, how many times do I unroll? Okay. okay, I'll tell you on the slide in about five slides from here. Okay. Um, then the second part is the, the communication between threads. And I'll talk about that later on because this is where the memory model comes in. Yes? Uh, so your, your analysis is based on, on C inputs, not, not the output generated by some compiler which could do okay. its own instruction. Correct. Correct. So um, 
is there something fundamental with uh, taking the output generated by compilers as close to the C program? So that would be a very good choice of something to do. Take the output of the compiler, use that as an input for this tool. Right, so what, what, what is the trade-off? So the trade-off is when you take the output of a real compiler, so I use, I use more abstraction, a more abstract view of what's happening in this in C with all the things I said about like pointer keeping lists of pointers as offsets. Also manipulating individual pieces of a machine word. Uh, so all of these things are a little bit harder if you do them at, if, at the actual output of a real compiler. So what I would do if I tried this, I would actually hack into the intermediate representation in the compiler and do this right before it generates the code while I still have all this information from the of the, of the higher abstraction level from this for source code. So, so the, it's, it's, a, it's about how, how much overhead you need in your tool. tool to yes, so I, I, do, I do try really hard to make my encoding as you know, concise as possible and exploit abstractions that are present in the source code. Um, yeah. OK, so here comes the questions about the loop bounds. So I, clearly, I do not know in advance how many times I have to unroll the loops. So what I do is un I, I unroll them once, then I run my tool, check for errors, everything. If I find errors, I don't have to unroll loops anymore. I found an error. It's a sound counter example. If there are no errors, I check if there are executions that exceed the loop limit. So I basically run the SAT solver specifically to, to answer that question. And if I find executions where the loop limit is exceeded, then I just increase the loop limit and start over. And uh, so for the, for the examples we're looking at here, this process actually terminates because the loops inside those data types do not loop forever. They're bounded naturally with the fact that you only call finitely many operations in each test. If it does not terminate, it usually is a bug, in which case you can interrupt the process, look at the trace, and find out why didn't it terminate. Yes. Algorithms designed to be fair in the sense, even if I, if, it, if there are two transactions that are trying to stomp on each other. Yeah, so they have a variety of fairness, like the definitions of different degree of difficulty of implementation and guarantee. Yes. So there's obstruction freedom, there is weight freedom. So you generate a new set of CNF clauses for unrolling? Yeah, so my tool does not, unro does not support the unrolling with the same encoding. So you really have to start over after you unrolled more. Is it possible to reuse work? It's very hard. So I think it can be done. I mean, if I, did, if I structured my whole encoding procedure more cleanly and with that in mind, I could probably do it. Um, yeah, so this, is not, this would be an optimization of the tool, sure, to do this sort of without starting over. So did you observe any examples of data structures in which uh, there's a bound on the execution depth only if you assume fair scheduling? No, I didn't see that. So basically, you, the test would terminate regardless of the schedule. Yes. So for example, uh, one thing that could happen potentially is that one thread, if you schedule it again and again, it will just spin around in a loop waiting for some condition right. to evaluate to true. But that condition won't be set to right. true until you schedule some other thread first. Right. So that's um, against the design principles that the designers of these algorithms follow. So they don't want to write an algorithm that does that because they want to guarantee you some progress. That's why I didn't hit that problem here. There's one case where it does happen, which is with locks. Obviously, if you have a spin loop that l waits till a lock is free, that would be an example. So I handle that specifically for locks. So the spin loops in the lock, I do not unroll with these bands because that would not terminate. I see. I mean, but this could happen with CAS operations too, right? You sit around in a loop uh, on CAS. So but if, your CAS, if your CAS fails, yes. it means that you interfered with somebody else, which means that somebody else made progress. So the next time you come around to the same place, that other thread has made progress. So somebody makes progress every time a CAS fails. That's the kind of guarantee these algorithms make. We can take the software. Yeah, OK. So we go, come back to the specification mining. So I said earlier that um, I basically enumerate the set of valid observations before I check 
So the, how do I enumerate all the correct observations? It's actually not as easy as just enumerating all executions because there are too many executions. So I actually use the fact that this is a SAT solver and I can formulate constraints uh, to enumerate the valid observations. So I start with an empty set of observations. Then I solve for a serial execution, meaning an execution where all operations are atomic, such that the observed values are not contained in my current observation set. And once I find that, I add it to the observation set, and I repeat this process. So basically, every time I call the SAT solver, you know, I want it to give me a new observation, a fresh one. Uh, so at the end, when I'm done, I have, when the SAT solver says unsatisfiable, I know I have found all possible observations. And that's my observation set here. So that, that I do that in the preliminary step, and then I take this, when I verify the executions on the relaxed model or on the sequentially consistent model, and check that all executions, you know, are within that observed set. And uh, I want to compare this method to something we did before. So this is not the only way you can do this. So what we did, and we had this paper in, we, we're going to have this paper in PLDI07. We had this paper last year where we used commit points. Um, and I want to compare these two approaches. So what's the idea of the commit points? The idea with the commit points is that, uh, that you have the user tell the tool where does an operation commit. And uh, a commit point is just a logical point where this operation takes place. So if you have several threads executing currently, you look at the relative order of the commit point and it tells you the logical order of the operations. They're often published along with the algorithm. And, uh, the reason why we abandoned this is that it can actually be really complicated to specify those commit points. So while they're a great tool if you're looking at proving correctness of some algorithms in an abstract way, if, you're, if you actually have to annotate the commit point in your code, it gets really difficult because you may need to use facts about the execution that are non-local to a particular thread. In the easiest case, it's always the same instruction, but sometimes what happens in other threads influences which of your instructions is your commit point. So um, given that, you know, comparing those two, the specification meaning wins out because it's more general and more automatic and it turns out to be even faster. So there's really, at this point, no reason in this tool to use commit points. So we, I give a little runtime comparison. Um, this is exponential scale on both. Compare each, each bullet is an individual test case and uh, basically, if the bullet is under the diagonal, it means that the specification mining is faster. So you see, for all tests, the specification mining was faster. And to quantify that, uh, these diagonal lines are constant ratio ratios. Uh, so down here, this is a 10 times improvement. So that's an order of magnitude there. And the average was about 2.59. Well, I don't understand. So the reason is that for the commit points, um, I have to encode two executions in, in the same SAT formula. So that the method with the commit points encodes both the serial execution and the relaxed execution in one big SAT formula. And that's just a much bigger SAT instance to solve. Yes. Can I just ask one more? Just a it, this is related, but OK, go ahead. So the, does the are you are you including the time for finding out the specification? Sure, you're doing sure. that. Even? Absolutely, yes. Okay, no but then I think if you're comparing perhaps a little bit apples and oranges here, because the commit points in some sense are part of the algorithm that you're checking, right? If is the correctness proof of the algorithm depends on where you place these commit points, and the second, the specification mining, you ignore this commit points. Oh, yes, and you well, so you have a more liberal okay. algorithm in some sense. That it's that's not. It's not, right. well, that depends on your standpoint. If you want to find out if your commit points are right, sure, then you want to specify the commit points and you want the tool to report violations of the commit points. But in some cases, you do not know the commit points. And then, you know, you don't care about where they would go. You just want to find out is the result achieved. But I agree with you, if you actually care about the commit points, for some other reason than just correctness, you know, in the, in the sense that I'm checking, then you might want to annotate them. Okay. So I give you some related work here. I won't talk about it in detail. I use uh, the C intermediate language. 
CBMC does a lot of the same techniques, and the correctness conditions were elaborated in this paper. Okay, so I want to part. I want to go on to the sort of theoretically interesting part about this, which is the axiomatic concurrency model. So I haven't talked about the memory model up to this point very much. I just told you relaxed memory models, reorder executions, split instructions. That's all I've said. It wasn't very precise. So the reason was that it's actually there's not just one relaxed memory model. There are lots of them, and and all of these architectures that I list here use different ones. And uh, in order to deal with that. Um, I mean, my approach is basically, if you verify the software, you want to write it for the worst possible machine. So I did derive a model called relaxed, which is weaker than all these models. So if you write code that works in this model, you know you got it right for all these models. Um, so at the core was sequential consistency. And I, I want to give you a little more like visual views of what's happening in the memory model. So for sequential consistency, we see programs executing on two processors. We only care about the loads and stores at this point. And those loads and stores go to a shared memory. And conceptually, this is interleaved, meaning that only one of them you know, can access memory at a time, gives us a natural interleaving of these loads and stores. Now, how do we formalize that? And this is really where you can go different ways. And uh, you know, I think it's worth pointing out these two ways, because I think the community has focused much more on the operational model in the model checking world. While in the architectural world, people have focused much more on the axiomatic model. And I think there's something very interesting in comparing those two. So uh, I'm looking at a program here which has two processors. One does a store and a load. The one does just a store. You can see that this load and this store go to the same address. Now in the operational model, I model my, the my executions are modeled by states and transitions. So I have an initial state up here. And my transition corresponds to executing a single instruction at a time. So in basically, at the beginning, I can either execute this instruction or this instruction going two different ways. Then here I have a choice of executing instruction two or three. And uh, you, can, you can see if I do one and three first or three and one first, I end up in the same spot here. But depending on if I do two here, I get a zero because this store hasn't happened yet, while here I get a one. So this is standard, standard view of concurrent systems for model checking um, and for a lot of other things. However, in the architecture world, people look at it a little different. So the, the axiomatic model basically does the following. It describes these instructions as events. So we have three different events. It describes the value that was loaded or stored by event E as an entity V of E. And I have a total order over all events. And then basically I define what is a valid execution by using axioms. So I say this set of events, this valuation of events, and this order represents a valid execution if, first of all, one has to happen before two because it's in program order. And secondly, the value of the load equals the last value stored to the same location. And uh, I can show you the actual axioms that I use in my tool when working with SC. So this is the same thing, but now with you know, a little more detail. So I encode a set of addresses, values. I have a set of memory accesses. Um, I categorize them into stores and loads. These are just subsets of all accesses. And here is the memory address and the value loaded by each access. Furthermore, I have a partial order over those memory accesses, P. This is the program order, meaning that this doesn't order all accesses, but if two accesses happen in the same, on the same processor, then you know, this represent, is represented by the fact that they appear in a specific program order. There's also the memory order, which is the total order over all accesses. And this is actually the thing that is so non-deterministic about the execution. Um, now, how, how do I define the axioms? So in order to define the axioms, Concisely, I say that I introduce this set S of L, set of stores that are visible to a particular load, by saying for each store, for each load, the following stores are visible. It's stores that have the same address, that go to the same address, and precede the load in memory order. After having said that, I can now define the executions as follows. First of all, if things are ordered by program order, they have to be ordered the same way by the memory order. So this is saying, basically, the memory order respects the program order. The second one basically says, 
loads get the value from the most recent store, expressing that, and this is expressed technically by saying, loads get the value out of the set of visible stores that is maximal with respect to the memory order. Um, yeah, I, I, so, okay, I'll go on with this. So now what's happening on the relaxed memory model? So that was sequential consistency. What's going on on relaxed memory models? So there are two things. So we have store buffers. This is the main relaxation for performance reason. The fact that the processor can do a store, and instead of committing to the shared memory, the store sits in a queue. In this queue, it can be seen by loads going from the same processor. So the arrow is here. The arrows indicate the flow of the data. So you see that stores flow this way and loads flow this way. But if a load hits in this store queue, it will actually get the value from here rather from the shared memory. So the, the takeaway point is that stores happen locally before they happen globally. So there's no atomic store anymore. There's like a local store happening immediately and then a global store happening sometime later. Well, the other relaxation is that the processor doesn't actually execute the instructions in sequence. But um, it's more like this. It has an instruction window, which I try to visualize here by turning the program upside down, like to the left, 90 degrees. And the processor sort of opportunistically executes these instructions in any order it sees fit. That makes it possible to execute it faster overall. And the result is that access is executed out of program order, subject to some restrictions. So you can't do that in all cases. Now, how does that influence the axioms I showed you earlier. So there are basically two locations that I need to change. First here, what are the stores visible to a load? I have to include stores that are sitting in the local buffer but ha don't have, are not committed globally yet, which means this set got just a little bit bigger. Stores that precede the load in program order are always visible to that load, even if they haven't committed globally yet. And here I have relaxation saying, um, that in some cases it's okay if the memory order does not match the program order. You know, these are just the specific conditions. So you can actually, if you work through this, you'll see that this corresponds to the relaxations um, we showed earlier. But it, it's, a, it's tricky to, to go through this. Anyway, the, the, the good news is that once I have these axioms, I can actually compile these axioms into my SAT formula. So how does it work? So after doing all these previous steps with the enrolling and so on, we know we have finite sets for everything. And after my range analysis, I have finite ranges for values and addresses. So I can really take these axioms and compile them into a SAT formula. Specifically, I, I use to represent this memory order, I take Boolean variables, uh, Boolean variable mxy that represents you know, this ordering, meaning I have a quadratic number of variables and then I, I add constraints that force transitivity of that order. Sebastian, how do you get finite ranges for the addresses? Um, that's the range analysis. So I do a flow insensitive analysis over all the values of all the assignments in the program and all the memory locations. So is this assuming that there is no dynamic memory allocation? No, I have dynamic memory allocation, but again, um, you know, your program is enrolled and finite, so you only have a finite number of places so where it gets dynamic. Do you do this analysis for each enrolling? Or yes. Do you do this upfront once? No, no, this is for after I enroll. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's an important point, yeah. It wouldn't work, yeah. But your values can still be symbolic, symbolic right? Yes. yes. So they're symbolic in the sense that they're sat variables. Symbolic volumes. Okay, symbolic. But I do, I do, when I encode them into SAT, I do encode this as bit vectors. So I have like a large bit vector representing all possible values. But you only need as much precision as the number of distinct values. Right. So I actually, you know, um, there's a choice of how you want to do this. You could try to compact it into a small bit vector as possible. I do the opposite and make a really large bit vector. But thanks to the range analysis, I'm able to fix like almost all parts of the bit vector I can statically fix. Yeah. So, so, this is, so this is the complexity of your uh, encoding reduction yes. on the side. But, uh, do you, are you going to talk about also, just curious, the complexity of the original program for finite traces? So you started by saying, I mean, for instance, checking sequential consistency in general is undecidable yeah. for finite traces. Are you going to talk about that some? No. No. Or, or, uh, or I can ask for <laughs> no, Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. 
So, you know, yeah. I, I don't know what it would be, right? Yeah, I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, of course, I, I have to support fences and synchronization. Um, I use classic load, 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 store, store, load, store, store fences. I also use some weaker forms of load, load. Um, the advantage of using these weaker forms is that there are no ops on some platforms. So if I, by using the weakest possible fence in my program, I make it easier to take that program and run it on a real processor. For example, if my program only contains store, store, and uh, dependent load fences, or actually let's say store, store, and alias load fences, and I want to run this on x86, then you know, I don't need any fences at all, because those fences are automatically guaranteed by that model. Um, I also model synchronization um, by using atomic constructs. So most of synchronization operations like compare and swap, double compare and swap, load links, they're conditional. You can write code for all of these using atomic sections. So, yeah? So how big is n in n squared and n cubed? Just. OK, uh, so yeah, the number of axes is, is a few hundred. I'll show, I'll show that later. Yeah. Yes? So you have a relaxed memory model that you encode axiomatically. Yeah. Uh, what is the complexity of encoding uh, common practical memory models such as the x86? Um, so that's, they're the same. So there, there, there are only slight differences. So, so the reason for doing the uh, generalized relaxed memory model is, is uh, because um, because I don't want to debug my algorithm 10 times for 10 different platforms. Um, I want to you know, get it right for my relaxed model and then having some way of porting that to other platforms is, is more or less straightforward, as I said, because some fences just fall out and others stay in. Yeah? So, so when people come up with these algorithms and they prove it, do they prove it for some memory model or? Uh, they, they always it? assume sequentially consistent platforms. So they, they stay away from, from this problem with relaxed models. There won't be any fences in their algorithms. So they say things like, you know, in our actual implementations, we put in fences. But in order to find out where, we just tested it. So that's as far as they go. But when it comes to sequential consistency, they prove that things are correct. The fence thing is in the section just before related work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what, I, <laughs> what does that say about the previous slide? <laughs> okay. So, those are basically two two different approaches. To, you know, the operational memory models, which work with explicit model checking, and this has been done. This works okay on on small code snippets. And this is the approach that I'm taking, axiomatic models plus SAT solvers, which uh, I think scales better. But of course, you know, you can always find examples that work better for one or the other. And uh, this has the operational memory models, you know, leave you this induction over time that model checking gives you. So you, ha you get a, a different sense of completeness if you, if you actually do model checking than if you do these bounded test cases. So, you know, both have their value. But, uh, so results. Let me just sort of summarize what the experiences were. So I studied the following algorithms. These were all published, um, you know, some of them pretty long ago, 1996. Some of them more recent. Um, so these are all these are all you know distributed algorithms conferences. All of them have some form of correctness proof, and uh, that's interesting because some of them had bugs, even though they had correctness proofs. So I, I found some regular bugs, meaning that bugs that also appear on sequentially consistent memory models. The SNARK algorithm has two previously known blocks. So I was, I was tipped off to looking at this algorithm by a paper by Lamport, which actually model checks the SNARK algorithm and reproduces these blocks. The blocks were found by the original authors. So they, they must have, after having published an incorrect proof, they must have you know, revised it and found the box. Um, so one of the blocks is very easy to hit. The other one actually requires a large test. So this is a deck. So I have pop left and pop right. So this was the test I, I used to find the bug, which, you know, it has eight threads and eight operations. Um, I looked at the paper that publishes, you know, the known bug. The known bug that they talk about uses seven operations. So I'm not that far away from, you know, the best thing that found. But this is interesting because, you know, I can't come here and say small test cases are always good enough to find the bug. So here's an example where you really need a lot of operations. 
by the way, did you need as many as eight threads, or could you have done with the same number of operations and fewer threads? So I didn't go through the uh, exercise of you know finding the minimal test to find it. So uh, it's pos possible to find it with fewer, I think, but I'm not sure if there's fewer than seven because I read the original description of the bug and it has a scenario that requires at least seven. Seven threads? Yeah, no, not seven threads, sorry, seven operations. Yeah, yeah. So that your question is correct. I'd be shocked if it manifests itself only with eight threads. No, I think you're absolutely right. So the reason why I put all these in different threads is not because I need that many threads, I need that many operations. Okay. And uh, as I said earlier, my tool, you know, doesn't, it's no problem if there are eight threads. It's the number of operations that are difficult. So I get more coverage by putting them in different threads. Uh, I also found a bug that was not previously known in the lazy list based set. So there was a, a missing initialization in one of the fields. And, uh, you know, the curiosity is that this was actually formally verified with PVS. Uh, it was, you know, in last year's CAF. It was actually the talk right before my talk. That <laughs> and, uh, you know, what, what, what does it tell us? I mean, the proof is correct. The problem is the hand translation from the pseudocode into the PBS script. So when they translated the pseudocode to PBS, or maybe even later on when they wrote the pseudocode for the paper, you know, there was a mismatch between the PBS code and the source code. Basically, accidentally they fixed the bug during the translation. Um, so in this case, the marked field, is, is that a global variable? No, that's, a, that's just a field in the node. So when you create, okay. a new, you know, in Java, this is automatic. You get all your fields initialized when you create a new object. In C, it is not. Yes. So uh, it's right at the border between what's the well, you know. So it's like the kind of thing that you find when you, when you automatically translate your source code, but you may miss when you do some hand proof or some more abstract proof. Um, and of course, I found many failures on relaxed memory models, so this is standard. Um, these are not mistakes in the algorithms because these algorithms were made for sequentially consistent models. So I inserted fences by hand. Interesting is I didn't need any store load or load store fences. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, it's interesting food for discussion for people who are designing, you know, the volatile semantics for C++, which is going on right now. There was a meeting between Microsoft and IBM last week. And, uh, you know, in terms of what fences are important, what fences should be automatic in volatiles and what fences should not be automatic. Um, also, for, the, for finding these failures, I did not need these large chess cases. So, you know, you c it, the tool actually works a lot better for this purpose, which was the purpose I designed it originally for. Uh, here's an overview over the results. One, uh, these are the bugs that I found on SC, the fences that I inserted. So I can, sh I mean, for each fence, I can show you a failing execution. And of course, you could agree or disagree that this is the right place to put the fence. So it's not, there's no automatic fence placement. You actually have to know how the algorithm is supposed to work in order to decide how to put the fence in to fix it. Um, tool performance. So the thing to take away is just the scale and those two sides. This doesn't actually matter. So what you see is this is a logarithmic scale and this is not. So the answer is it blows up on large test cases. But you can also tell that up to here it works really quite well. See, just the number of memory accesses in the unrolled code is, you know, a few hundred. And the conclusion. So the conclusion is, I, I successfully bridged the gap. So concurrent data types are hard to get right. There are mistakes in published papers, and the tool was long overdue to do this automatically. Uh, the counter examples are great to understand what's going on in the memory models. Um, I can handle a realistic level of detail. It's scalable enough for the example studied. I wouldn't claim this to be scalable. It doesn't have the characteristics of a scalable algorithm. Um, we don't need a formal specification for the data type. That's kind of cool. That's also what, you know, what's confusing people, like where's the specification? So I think that's a nice, nice property of a tool that, that it can you sort of automatically get the specification. Uh, and I think it makes the whole log-free idea a lot more realistic. So without tool, it really takes a genius to get this right uh, or prove it right. And uh, with the tool, it takes an expert. Still not for everybody. I, you know, lock-free programming is very tricky. Now, future work. So uh, importantly, I want to make the tool publicly available. So I have been working on that, but I need to document more. And uh, it needs to be packaged and everything. I want to support weaker memory models. So. Um, there's the question about supporting wilder architectures like PPC or Antanium. 
uh, which makes weaker guarantees in the memory model. But there's also the question is passing directly to the language level memory models, like used in Java or C++, which I think would be very interesting. Um, I think there's a lot going to go on in this area uh, very soon. And uh, this is an interesting point. I've, I've talked with Shaz about that. So taking these axiomatic encodings and applying them to other asynchronous verification projects, like cache coherence protocol, uh, would be very interesting. Uh, I think there's something good to come from using these axiomatic encodings to encode true concurrency versus interleaved concurrency. So the, the, the thing to do here would be to take my global total order of accesses and relax it to a partial order, uh, like done in concurrency theory, and see if that can actually improve the verification of asynchronous uh, so models. Uh, I would also like to improve the solver components. So as I said earlier, my, my encoding is, is cubic in variables and quadratic in constraints. Now that's only because the solver doesn't support the theory of total orders or the theory of partial order, orders. So um, having a solver support that directly you know, could cut back that and it could speed up the solving because transitivity constraints could be propagated much faster by, by a specialized theory. Um, then this is interesting automatic fence insertion. So this is, as I said earlier, you can't really insert the fences automatically because you can, you can suggest fences to a programmer or you can help a programmer understand what's going wrong in an execution. Because analyzing the counter examples really is the hardest part at this point of using this tool. Um, I would also like to develop reasoning techniques for relaxed memory models. So, you know, after you have done all this model checking, at some point you would really like to sit down and, and prove that it's true for all executions. And this is not even clear how to do on relaxed memory models. People don't know how to do that. They haven't done it. So that should be done at some point. And uh, I would also like to actually use the tool to build a concurrent library. So there's nothing like using the tool to, you know, making the tool truly better. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank the speaker. Yes. Uh, can you comment a little bit about scalability? So, for the experiment and the example that you have considered so far, it sounds like your your tool handles them pretty well. I mean, you had this logarithmic scale graph yes. there, but still a thousand seconds is okay. So, but so I don't know that area at all. But are they very very large? Very very. I mean, you, you just is this the sample? The, the set of examples you've considered is representative, or is basically only the simplest algorithm in that category, or are there extremely large, log-free uh, implementation of uh, uh, data objects used in libraries, or basically, or is it yeah. kind of a niche kind of application where current technology handles already, let's say, 90% of what's useful in that space? Right. So the examples are reasonable algorithms. So the, the examples are reasonable algorithms in the terms of that there are algorithms that you know are very complicated and they're what people actually publish and, and do. Of course, when you go to an actual implementation, things are never as clean as in the pseudo code of the paper. So you will get a lot more code in an actual concurrency library than I looked at in these examples. And in that setting, you would have to develop a compositional way of verifying them. So what typically happens if you write an actual library is you will reuse pieces between different implementations. And uh, in order to do that compositionally, which is the right way to do anyway, um, is you need to define a better specification of concurrent APIs than we have currently. So I think that's something that, that is really lacking in concurrency libraries and actually prevents writing concurrency libraries for something like this, is that you, it's actually not clear how to specify the behavior of a concurrent data type on a relaxed model. Like if you want to allow some like leeway for the hardware to relax things, then you really have to come up with a better way of, of specifying, the AP, specifying the behavior of your data type. I think that's uh, actually another future work topic to do. Yes? So you only sound with respect to the input test cases you provide. When you, write, you write these symbolic test cases yes. and you only sound with respect to those test cases. Yes. Um, so do you have some insight on how to come up with these test cases? Uh, so, you know, it's just practical experience. So, I mean, one thing to do would be develop a coverage criteria and then automatically generate these test cases, you know, to meet that. That would be a good project. But so far I can only have some, you know, 
basic experience of using these test cases. And what I can say is that, um, as I said, for the memory model related relaxations, small tests are easy, and you can just put you can just you know put one operation in each thread and run a number of threads, and you're very likely to hit it right away. Um, it's definitely not necessary to craft these tests. So you don't have to go and think very hard about what has to go, what should go wrong, what could go wrong. Um, by using a, a large number of threads uh, and putting you know, all these operations in these threads, it will find some interleaving that finds the bug. Yeah. 